destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. And the people said, Give us a king to judge us. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse number 5. We welcome you today to our study of the book of 1 Samuel. As always, we want to encourage you to locate your Bible and have it handy because we're going to look to the Word of God together in our study of 1 Samuel. As always, today's lesson is being brought to you by members and individuals of the Church of Christ. The Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. If you've got a Bible question, you'd like to learn more about the church or anything they do in worship, they'd be happy to sit down, open up the Word of God, and study together with you. You'll find people in the Lord's body who love God, who love souls, and who are concerned about men and women going to heaven. Here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd also like to help you in your study of the Word of God. Please check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We have a wide variety of good Bible study material. We've got video lessons that are archived, audio lessons. We've got all kind of written material that you can use, and it's all free from our website. Also, if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, you can download that or we'll be glad to send you a hard copy as well. You can, from our website, fill out a media request form and we'd be glad to help you with that. Also, in today's world where technology is growing so fast, we want to encourage you to check out our app, both for Android and iPhone, and that would be a great way to study the Word of God on the go as well. We're so glad that you've joined us in our study of 1 Samuel today. These books of the Old Testament, 1 and 2 Samuel and 1 and 2 Kings, are a lot about the history of Israel, but I don't want us to get lost in just that history. For the Bible says in Romans 15, 4, the things that were written before time, were written for our learning that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might find hope. That passage teaches us that the Old Testament and many of the great lessons, like some of those we're going to be mentioning, are designed to help us learn lessons about God, about God's dealings with man, and about ourself and our relationship with Almighty God. Now, having just left the, or on the tail end of the dark days of the judges, with that little glimpse of hope, of Ruth in between, we now kind of move away from the cycle of the judges into Israel's desire to have a king. Uh, there are some key verses that we want to mention and some key ideas that will help us to understand the book of 1 Samuel better. Probably the key verse in this whole idea of 1 and 2 Samuel and 1 and 2 Kings is found in 1 Samuel 8 verse 5. The people, it displeased, the Bible says it displeased uh, Samuel when the people said, give us a king to judge us so that we can be like all the nations around us. Here was the problem in that. Israel was not without a king already. God was reigning as king over Israel, and Israel saying, give us a king, is more of an indictment of how they felt about God than how they felt about the nations around them. They were in essence, God took that personally, and we're going to see that. They were in essence dethroning God and wanting to put a human king on the throne. And friend, the Bible tells us in Hosea 13, 11, God gave him a king in his anger took him away in his wrath. That wasn't God's intended plan, although God could and would work through that. God was still reigning as king over Israel. One of the key phrases that we'll hear and see, and it's kind of reminiscent of this whole time of the Israelites under the kings is the words of Saul, or the words of Eli to Saul in 1 Samuel 15 verse 22. 
Eli said to Saul, or Samuel said to Saul in 1 Samuel 15 verse 22, it's better to obey than to sacrifice. Israel had got so caught up in the, 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 the ritual, the sacrifices, the offering of the various sacrifices they would make, that they thought this ritual was what it was all about. And God said through uh, Samuel, it's better to obey than to sacrifice. Israel's problem was a lack of obedience to Almighty God. Now, as we look to the book of 1 Samuel, there are really three main characters, and those three main characters will naturally give us three main divisions in the book. Chapters 1 through 7 of 1 Samuel is all about Samuel, the boy who's going to grow into and kind of be the in-between between the last judge and the first king, Samuel himself. Then chapters 8 through 31 uh, we have an example of Saul as king. And I know that takes us from chapter 8 to the end of 1 Samuel. And so chapters 8 through 31, we've got kind of what's happening with Saul, the first king. But in the midst of that, there is kind of a backstory and someone rising up as well, and that is David. About chapter 16 all the way through chapter 31, we begin to see David on the increase and him who, and he's going to be the ultimate king uh, after God's own heart. And so let's talk today about some living messages, some basic messages that we can take with us from the book of 1 Samuel. How does this book and its lessons apply to Christians in the, in the century in which we live today? Well, friend, one major lesson that is so important that I think, think sometimes we overlook is we need to be real, real careful what we ask for because we might just get it. 1 Samuel chapter 8, that context where the people are going to ask for a king, God's going to give them exactly what they want, but it is definitely not what they need. And God deals with that uh, according to His grace and mercy even then, but there were consequences to that. I want you to listen to 1 Samuel chapter 8, and I want you to hear the heart of God in this. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse number 4. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Look, you are old. Your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Listen to this. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. Now hear what God said. And the Lord said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. How did God feel about the people? They want to be like everybody else. Our friends and our neighbors are doing it, and it looks like a pretty good idea. Seems to be working out well for them. We want a king to judge us. Well, friend, that was just not only an indictment of their desire to be like everybody else, but God took that personally. God said to Samuel, don't take it personally yourself. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. And friend, I want you to think about this. How well did it work out for Israel when they, in essence, dethroned God and started putting human kings in? Well, Saul didn't work out too well. Uh, David had his own problems. You look down the line of all the, uh, all the kings of both Judah and Israel, and the large majority of those were not what God wanted and were not what the people wanted. In fact, this will lead to Israel going into idolatry. It will lead to Israel going both into Babylonian and Assyrian captivity. It was not a good thing for them. And so the practical lesson is, we need to be real, real careful what we ask for. Think about it and really see if that's what we need because we might just get it and realize we had something better all along. You know, sometimes that happens with worldly pleasures. Sometimes that happens with things of the world that we desire. Sometimes that happens with things that our, our passions think we need, when in reality, we were better off 
as we were. And so as we think about this idea, let's realize another very practical lesson from 1 Samuel 8 and their request, and it's this. Friends, we've got to obey God and let God rule and reign in our lives if we're going to have the best and the happiest life. Who's king of our life? Acts chapter 2 verse 36 tells us, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly, God's made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When I obeyed the gospel, when, when, when one becomes a Christian, I am acknowledging the lordship and the kingship of God and Christ over my life. As the book of Revelation says, He is Lord of all lords and King of all kings. And friend, I need to find the peace and the comfort and the contentment that comes with letting God rule and reign in my life, letting him have control, following his lead, and submitting to him as Lord and as Christ. Now, let's think about some other practical lessons, and there are so many that we won't hardly begin to touch the, some of the major ones today, but we'll try to highlight some of those. Let's talk about some of the major lessons that will unfold throughout the book of 1 Samuel. There is such a powerful lesson that I don't want us to miss in the opening verses of 1 Samuel chapter 1. I want you to open your Bible with me to 1 Samuel chapter 1 verse 11, and I want you to see from the example of Hannah what parents can do to help their children serve God. Look at these words. You remember the story of Hannah. Hannah's been barren. She's been without child. Her rival, Peninnah, she has children, and she's jealous of that. And so she prays to God. And in her prayer requesting a child, I want you to hear these tender words. Notice 1 Samuel chapter 1. I want you to look with me in verse number 11. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, listen to this, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall be upon his head. We understand the promise that she's making here and how that would relate to Samuel being a great servant of God and possibly uh, relating to the Nazarite vow as well. But listen to those words. God, if you'll just give me a child, I'm going to give him to you all the days of his life. Friend, isn't that a great motto for every parent today? God, if you bless us with children, we're going to do our best to help them grow up, to serve you, and to put you first. Aren't you thankful for parents like that in the Bible? Like Zacharias and Elizabeth in Luke chapter 1 verse 6, the parents of John the Immerser, who were both righteous before God, walking in all the statutes and commandments of the Lord blameless. How we need parents who will train up their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And so an encouragement to parents, be like Hannah. If God richly blesses you with children, do your best to give them to God, help them to know God, help them to become Christians, and serve God all their life. But then there's kind of a flip side to that. Uh, we've seen what a parent can do to help his children go to heaven, well, what would be something that would send your children down the wrong spiritual path? Eli, one of the final judges of Israel, uh, makes some bad decisions that will ultimately affect his children. And just like we encourage parents to follow the example of Hannah, I want you to notice what happens in 1 Samuel 2, about verse number 12. Listen to these words. The Bible says, Now the sons of Eli were corrupt. They did not know the Lord. Well, look in verse 17. What do you mean they're corrupt? Therefore, the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for the men abhorred the offering of the Lord. And as we'll go on to study this context, Eli didn't do his part. He didn't correct them. He didn't stop them. He allowed it to go on. And so he's got sons that are corrupt, and he's not putting a stop to that. He's not turning them from the wrong way and directing them towards God's way. He's kind of complicit in it in that he allows that to go on. 
Friend, as a parent, it's not always easy to realize wrong in our life and to correct wrong in our children's lives. But if you love somebody, won't you do what it takes to help them, protect them, and ultimately help them go to heaven? Sometimes we have to say, that's not right. That's not what God wants us to do. And we sit them down. We show them from the Bible. We open up the Word of God. We encourage and we strive in every way to point them back in the right direction. Eli made a great failure in that he did not stop his sons and correct them. Now, they had their own mind. We understand that. They, they, they had their own will and they were going to make their own choices. But what did Eli do in this? What was his uh, result of that? And could he have done more? Those are questions that all of us, as we read 1 Samuel 2, are bound to ask. But then I want us to think about another bright spot in times like these. And that is the young man whom the book carries his name, Samuel. Samuel, who we read about in 1 Samuel chapter 1, is the son of Hannah. And uh, he, he's the one God gives her from her request. And this boy has such a, a great heart. And he's ready to serve God from the get-go. I remember the scene in the setting, and you'll recall it from 1 Samuel chapter 3. Uh, Samuel is with Eli, and it, it's as though it is drawn to the near of the end of the day. And they've gone to lay down to sleep. And uh, Samuel hears a voice, as it were. Samuel, Samuel. Of course, he runs to Eli because that's his master. He thinks that he's calling him. Well, eventually, Eli realized, I'm not doing it. Somebody must be doing it. And he gives him some advice. And I want you to listen to the heart and the mindset of Samuel. Then Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he, God, calls you, that you must say, Speak, Lord, your servant here. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood and called as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, Speak, Lord, your servant hears. What a great attitude Samuel had for such a young lad. And no doubt this would be a, a scary event in some ways. And yet here's a child who his mother had already made the commitment and turned him over to serve God. God calls out to this young man. What's his attitude? Speak, Lord. Your servant hears. Friend, can you find a better attitude and motto for the child of God than that? Uh, when God speaks to us, and he does through his word, right? Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, God who at various times and various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his Son. That's recorded in the New Testament. When I open my Bible and when I read God's Word and when I, when I hear the voice of God from Scripture, what does my attitude, what does an individual's attitude need to be? Friend, you cannot go wrong with the words of Samuel. Speak, Lord, your servant hears. What an awesome mindset of humility, willingness, and readiness to serve Almighty God. Now, we're going to see as the book progresses that Samuel is going to make some encouragements to the people of Israel, and he's going to try to at least move them in the right direction as they steer away from God toward an earthly king. I want you to notice what Samuel says in his address to Israel in 1 Samuel chapter 12. I'd like to invite you to look in verses 14 through 16 with me. Notice the Word of God says, If you fear the Lord and serve Him, and obey His voice, and do not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then both you and the king who reign over you will continue following the Lord your God. However, if you do, no, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you as it was against your fathers. Now therefore stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Samuel speaks very candidly to the people of Israel here. You've asked for a king. It wasn't God's intention. But even now, God can work with you. If you'll continue to follow me, if your king will continue to follow me, I'll bless you. 
But if your king departs and you follow that king instead of me, God says, the hand of God, the power of God is going to be against you. Friend, as I think about these words of Samuel to the people of Israel, we think about our own lives. And isn't it the case that as we have followed God, as we as a nation, as a people, as a congregation of God's people, as we've striven to follow God, to do His will, to let the Bible guide us in what we do, look at how richly we have been blessed. But as we depart further from God, as we depart further from His Word, as we devalue life and God's principles in America even more, is God going to continue to bless a people like that? Do you remember toward the close of Proverbs 14 and right about the start of Proverbs 15? The Bible says righteousness exalts a people, uh, exalts a kingdom, but sin is a reproach to any people. Just like with the days of the Israelites here, how we need the encouragement to seek God's will and to follow Him. Now, I want us to move to another very practical lesson that we're going to learn from uh, Saul himself. As you'll recall, now Israel is going to get their first king. Uh, Saul, who has a lot of potential, but he makes a lot of mistakes as well. And one of those comes in 1 Samuel 14 and 15. Basically, what's happened is this. In 1 Samuel 15, God has told the people, I want you to go out and take out these people. Take out Agag, the king. Don't, don't leave anything. Don't spare anything. Completely wipe it out. Well, they do most of that. About 95% of that, they do. But they spared the king. They spared some of the best of the flock. They kept some of the best of the spoils. And because of that, Saul now leads the people in disobedience. And Samuel is going to address him in doing that. And I want you to listen to what he says in verse number 17 following. So Samuel said to Saul, When you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of the tribes of Israel? Did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go, utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites. Fight against them until they're consumed. Why then did you not obey? The voice of the Lord. Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? And listen to Saul. Saul said, but I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission for which the Lord sent me and brought back Agag, king of Amalek. I've utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the plunder, the sheep and the oxen, the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord your God. Here, uh, Saul begins to make excuses to act like he's not the ruler and to put the people to blame. And listen what Samuel says next. So Samuel said in 1 Samuel 15, verse 22, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of ram. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry, because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He also has rejected you from being king. In essence, Saul says, hey, I did everything God asked. And Samuel says, uh, what's this bleeding of the animals I hear then? Who's this Agag who's over here? You didn't fully obey God. And he begins to say, kind of like Genesis 3, when Adam said, it's the woman you gave me. Uh, the people did it. No, you're the head of these people. You should have stopped that. And, you know, maybe their motive. Maybe, let's just give them the benefit of the doubt, okay? Maybe, maybe their motive was to offer the best to God. Maybe they kept back just a little bit of what God told them to destroy, and they were going to give the king, they were going to give some of the best of the herds, they were going to take the choicest silver and gold, and they were going to give that all to God. What did God say about that? To obey is better than to sacrifice. And to listen is to, better than the offering of burnt offerings. God said, Saul, I want you to hear me well on this. I didn't need your help. I didn't need you trying to amend things. I didn't need you putting your two cents in. I just wanted you to obey me. And because he didn't, it was viewed as 
rebellion. It was like the sin of witchcraft. It was basically a form of idolatry. And at this point, from chapter 15 onward, from these words onward, Saul goes down and David begins to come up. Now friend, what's the practical lesson that we can take away from this? Well, here it is so simply. All God wants me and all He wants you to do, all He wants us to do is to do what He says, right? Jesus said in John 14, 15, If you love me, help me out with all my commandments. No, that's not what He said. If you love me, do about 95%. No, not what He said. If you love me, keep my commandments. You're my friend if you do whatever I ask. John 15, verse 14. Friend, we need to see the importance of listening to God and just doing what He says. Matthew 7, verse 21, Jesus said, It's not everybody that looks up into heaven and says, Lord, Lord, that's going there. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Jesus asked the pious religious elite of his day, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Luke chapter 6, verse 46. And friend, the encouragement today, especially if you're not a child of God, is to simply obey what he says. Have you become a Christian? Have you submitted to the simple New Testament plan of salvation? Have you heard the word of God as the final authority? Romans 10, 17 says faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. Having heard that word, do you believe Jesus is the Savior of the world? John chapter 8, verse 24. Do you believe that so much so that you would turn from sin to serve God in repentance, Luke chapter 13, verse 3. Would you confess the name of Jesus before men, Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33. And would you, to become a child of God, to be washed in the blood of the Lamb, would you be baptized for the remission of your sins? Jesus said it so plainly. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Mark 16, 16. We hope that you'll join us next time in our study of 2 Samuel as we look to the Word of God together. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at one 855 Four five eight three nine zero five, or write to us at P.O. Box seven eight eight, McMinnville, Tennessee three seven one one one.